Perfect. Hey, we, we got another podcast on the way here. Uh, we have Seth on the line with us, and we're going to talk about our tree today and see what's going on in his world. And uh, we'll have a lot of fun. My name is Roy Canterbury, and I'm going to be a host today on Arch Talk 101. And let's get started. So, Seth, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So, tell us uh, um, how you got started in archery and maybe why you got started. Yeah. So, um, I grew up in a family that hunts. Uh, my dad got me into it at a very young age. Um, there's pictures of me that I don't even remember. Um, he had bought me a, a little bear bow when I was, I don't know, two or three. And I was out shooting targets with it. And um, I shot a rabbit with that bow. Actually, there's a picture of me when I was three or four years old with my little, it's one of those, uh, you know, they used to sell them at Walmart. They probably don't anymore with the political standing of the company. Oh, but yeah. the, the, they were like fiberglass arrows with a with like a shiny metal tip, like glued on the end, pretty blunt. But yeah, oh, I don't yeah. Know, for some reason I went out and uh, decided to shoot a rabbit with that thing, but I've been doing it, you know, as long as I could walk pretty much. Um, and then it just kind of progressed from there. My, my dad really got me into it and um, some family friends, EIG Yowie, um, was there since before I was born. He's a big archer. I know he's been on your show before. Um, he kind of helped me along through, through, through my process too. And uh, yeah, I used to shoot, I used to shoot a lot. I used to shoot 3d and, and, and spots and everything. And um, I don't as much as it anymore. I don't have the time, but um, it's, it's always been a passion of mine for sure. Yeah. Kind of, archery is one of those things that uh, you can, you can pick up at any age, you know, whether you're Absolutely. two or three or, or 82 or, uh, yeah. You can still pick it up. It's it's just well, you probably use about the same size bow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right. starting out at 82 as you would exactly. at it. Um, you know, it's it's just one of those things that's that's kind of fun and you can always pick it up. Sure, sure. So you say you you, know, you hunted as well as doing target. Uh what's probably your most memorable target shoot you was at? Um I've never done anything really crazy. A lot of local 3D 3D events. Um, nothing. I, I was never like a you know elite level shooter or anything. My dad raised me. Um, like I said, I don't remember a time where I wasn't shooting. But my dad raised me as this sound gonna sound weird, but as a killer. Like we, you know, you shoot to to harvest animals to you know, to to hunt to kill animals. So I never really like dove hard 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 into the target step i just wanted to be a better hunter so um so i'd go to local 3d shoots and and i'd go and shoot vegas in the winter time just to keep you know my skill up you know but I, when i shot vegas i might shoot 17 or 18 x's you know i mean nothing nothing too impressive or anything like that if that makes sense well and not everybody has the desire to go out there and shoot them 60 x's yeah exactly I, right i we'd all like to um, right i know when i when i start you know started many years ago is doing doing this you know uh a 298 would win a tournament oh sure you know you're winning tournament 298 now if you get a 300 you're not even going to win you got to get yeah. 59 60x yeah with um, the with the five when i was doing i shoot vegas you know which 30x or whatever and then the, the five spots even just at the local level, um, which I live next to one of the biggest archery dealers in the in the country. I pre people have probably heard of F6 Outdoors. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. It used to be Mike's Bow Shop. It used to be a huge, huge yeah. deal online. Um, but it's literally like three miles from my house. So there's a lot of guys there shooting. And there'd be four or five guys that shoot 300s. And they're just, you know, they're counting X's. It didn't matter if you shot a 298. Nobody even talked about it. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of crazy. There's a lot of skill around here. But well, and I'm and not I was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm not either, but uh, um, I know I, I like shooting targets, shooting spots to develop my skill. Oh, so absolutely. I knew if I put the pin where I wanted it, I knew I could hit it. Absolutely. And then I like doing the 3Ds because then that helped me judging yardage. Right. Now, now yep, granted, same. where you put the arrow, where you aim on a 3D target is not where you're going to aim on a deer. Absolutely. Or a live animal because. Yep. You got to worry about exit point, not entrance. Oh yeah, I mean, that just may be better, you know, better for hunting and kind of like you. It's like I, I only did those to get better at hunting. Yep, yeah. And th there's, I'd hate to guess how many deer get get you know wounded or or 
long, long blood trails because people don't know where to shoot them, you know, that's, and it kind of yeah. stinks, but, um, but yeah, everybody shoots a broadside 3d target and thinks that that's where you, you want to put it. And it's just, it don't work like that in the woods. You know that. No, so. no, it doesn't. It's not even close. Cause generally if you're up in a tree stand, uh, you're not gonna have a blood trail for quite a while. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You just plugged up, you plugged up the hole, exit hole. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why I teach them, you know, go for exit hole. Don't go for entrance hole. Aim yep. for the far side. So what I was, what I've always been taught um, is you never shoot a quartering two deer with a bow, which there's a lot of arguments to be made that you can. And and I I've done some things that you know my dad wouldn't be proud of or whatever. But I was taught to not shoot a quartering two animal. And then when it's quartering away, you aim for that offside leg as low in the body cavity as possible from, you know, if you're in a high tree stand, he liked to hang a tree stand for 30 feet high. So, oh, you know, you're low exit point. So you got blood right away. And, and if you hit that offside leg, uh, they're not going to go very far, you know, cause you're, you're no. right in the, right in the pump house there. So that's what I always, that's what he taught me. You run your pin up the offside leg, pretty low in the body cavity and let her fly. And, and it's worked pretty good for us. So, but yeah. Yeah, I don't put them up 30 feet. Mine are 15, 12, <laughs> yeah, or 20. He's, he's he's nuts. He, uh, I don't know. I'll never forget when I was probably five or six years old, he would, um, he'd hang his stands way, way, way up there. And he always used screw and spikes, you know. Um, this is back in, you know, late, late 90s, early 2000s. And he would climb all the way up to the top of the stand. And I'm a little bitty kid. So he put me in a, in a hunter safety harness tie a rope to me and he'd pull me up like a, like his bow and he'd <laughs> set a tree and I'd hunt up there every day with him for you know as much as I could get out there so um but yeah like I said I I was raised in it so yeah that's that's kind of interesting it because <laughs> so far up you know if you put oh, yeah. a decent distance for him you couldn't climb up you know, <laughs> no no absolutely kid. not yeah not even close I've done that I've climbed a pole where the, the they were so far apart this wasn't a tree stand set up, but this guy was like over six foot. So he set him up for him. All right. Well, I was climbing a pole to get on the top, top of the pole. And then you, you have a safety harness on and he jumped sure. for like a little barn and hang on it. And then, and then drop down. But uh, I got all the way to the top and my knees are just bad enough. There was nothing left of my knees. I, I right. could not, I could not put enough in it because it was just so far up. Right. And, and it's like, you know, I'm almost telling the guys like, can you pull me that last little couple of inches? <laughs> I'm right once I get up past this point, but I so, so far, you know, I'm, I'm using right. arms most of the time pulling me up because I'm, I'm so far on my knees. And Oh yeah. Man, and I, I, I'm not a small I couldn't even walk. Oh man. I, uh, I'm not a small guy by any means. I haven't been since I was 15 or 16, but I, still when I was that old dad, I was putting in screwing steps. And I eventually got him talked out of it. And I was like, hey, we got to, we got to start doing these ladders, these steps. <laughs> you're putting them yeah. way too far apart. This is ridiculous. So, and then when it's dark, you know, you're trying to climb down, you can't see those things. And oh, they're, they're a nightmare. Yeah. You just got to hope it's there. And, right. Uh, and when your arms are stretched all out and you got to let go of one of them to put your foot on a peg, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's when you fall. <laughs> that's, that's faith right there. That's the definition of faith. So yeah, you, you just hope it's there to catch it. But I had one tree stand that guy had set up, and it's like, well, how do you climb in it? There's no pegs in there. Well, what there was was they'd cut off branches, with little knobs. You know how the tree <laughs> would heal over itself. Sure. That's what you use to climb up. It was little knobs. Yeah. You know, there's a couple of those you had to use. It's like, oh, come on, like, come on, let's 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 <laughs> put some pegs in here. Right. <laughs> you know, there's yep. a couple of pegs, and then. The rest are climbing on just knobs on on cut off branches. Absolutely, <laughs> guys will do whatever they can to get out there. They don't, you know, they don't care. Yeah, so. yeah. I've had I've had some where uh, they set the stand up where you're climbing up, and then if you keep climbing, you hit your head on the tree stand. Right. It's like, how do you expect to get in this? You know, it's <laughs> yeah. I always put them on the sides. You climb up and you climb up above the tree stand and step down to the tree stand. Yep, yep. You know, so if it does fall for some reason, which most of mine don't, you know, I, I had one at that time. It was, uh, um, I had a little key, not a, a screwed in, and then it, it sat on there, so it hold it. Then chain, uh, there was chained around it, and you tighten the chain, and then I always put a ratchet strap on the bottom as well. Sure. You know, so it's nice and solid. And those that didn't have that, I'd put two ratchet straps on them. 
won the normal strap and I'd ratchet strap on top of it and then one across the bottom. So I had to have, you know, the factory strap as well as the other ratchet strap fail before the top would come loose. Sure. And I like to yes. set my, my uh, safety horn up so that as I'm sitting on the seat, it's pulling up slightly on me. Right. And as I'm yes. standing, it's pulling down. So you can't, you can't fall past your seat. Right. You know, if you yep. step off, all you're going to do is basically, you know, slam your, your tail in into the seat. Sure. Because that's all how further you can go down. Right. And I've used my safety harness to make a shot, you know, because I had to lean over far enough that, sure. you know, you got lean out a little bit and, and you, you, you got to trust your equipment because you're, you're depending on your life to save you if you fall. Right. And, and so, yep. you know, I'd lean out and, you know, you're not falling and lean out and, and get your shot. And, and, you know, the one thing on, on, safety harnesses a lot of people don't understand that even though the safety owner saves your life from falling you can still die because it oh, cuts yeah. off circulation your yep. blood flow stops so yep. that's why a lot of them now have that little loop on it so you can put your foot in and stand to take the yep. pressure off of you because you know once you're in that position you don't have a long time before you no die. That's, so absolutely that's something... a lot of other injuries too you can you know break bones and and all kinds of stuff, but you know, it's better than falling 25 feet or something, but it's still a, it's not, you know, comfort. Yeah. So, yeah, e even off a ladder stand that's only, you know, 12 feet tall. Yeah. Uh, it still know, hurts. That, yeah. It still hurts. <laughs> you, you know, right. so, so tell us about some of your, your hunting stories. I'm sure you've got some, some cool stories of some of the hunts you're on that are, were exciting or memorable or challenging. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a lot like uh, a lot like everybody. I'm sure my coolest stories are when I didn't end up killing the deer. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've had a lot of fun out there. Uh, shoot, I don't know. I I killed my first deer with a bow when I was twelve, I believe. Um, he was 148 inch, 13 pointer, really a nice deer, real heavy, uh, gigantic body deer. Makes made his rack look small. Um, super old deer and it was just i don't know it's kind of one of those things it was it felt like it was just meant to be me and dad went out and uh hung a ladder stand and he hung a hang on on the tree next to me and we were just going out where we i was going to shoot a doe i'd, I'd shot a lot of deer with a gun at that point i'd probably shot i don't know 10 or 12 deer with a gun by then um but it was gonna be my first year with a bow so uh first year that walked by pretty much is, is what we we're what we we're going for and lo and behold this you know this giant one of the oldest deer on the farm that we'd had pictures of and stuff um come out and uh there was absolutely no reason that he should have did what he did he came out in a food plot clear on the other side of the field you know 120 yards away and normally when they came out where he did they'd work that edge of the field and the closest he'd ever get you know 60 yards and then work out into the big ag field. So it was a it was a giant bean field, and then it had little fingers. And in the fingers, we'd plant clover. Uh, was what we did back then. So you know, I'm sitting over the clover, and he walked out, and you know, Dad's all excited, and I'm excited, but he's behind me. And Dad told me not to look. He didn't want me to get all worked up about it. But he told me where he was, and I knew where you know where he was. He said, "Don't turn your head." So. Uh, after about 10 seconds of that, it felt like I just couldn't help it anymore. So I turned and looked and watched him and he, he just moseyed right through the middle of the field and crossed the field onto my side and walked by it like nine yards. It just very strange. And yeah. The way the spot set up, this, this sounds weird, but the way the spot sets up, there's just no reason he should have came over there, but it's, it's like he was on a string and he just walked right to me and stopped there broadside. And I shot him and he ran 60 yards and, and toppled over um, in the woods uh we couldn't see him we heard him crash but um you know how they do on their death run sometimes they'll they'll crash then you can still hear them you know their legs are still working or whatever and he's making a lot of noise so we sat there till dark uh, a little past dark went down found the arrow and uh it didn't look great he was quartering away and it had uh some liver blood on it but i ended up getting the top of the top of the my side lung a little bit of liver and then the offside lung. And like I said, he was dead in, in 10 seconds, but had a little liver blood on it. So, uh, 
so dad, you know, elected, we backed out, went back at like 10 o'clock at night and walked up to the edge of the woods and we heard some crash on the leaves. And, uh, you know, so immediately dad, you know, we backed out again and it's just like a gut wrenching feeling, you know, I mean, it's bad. Yeah. It's bad at my age, you know, when you can't go find your deer, but when I was 12 and this giant buck and I was like, you know, just, I couldn't sleep. And, uh, it turned out it was, uh, we got down there and it must've been a possum or something. I mean, he'd been dead for, you know, forever, but, um, yeah, it was an unreal feeling. So me and me and dad and he had came down, um, we went and found that deer and, and there's actually a picture of it in this book. Um, uh, it was just, I'll never forget the moment. Like it was cool. We come up over the ridge and he's 25 yards away laying in the bottom of this little ditch. And, uh, you know, we all just, we, we lost it. It was awesome. We're all hugging and crying and everything. And it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's, all, it's always been that way. I, I don't know. It's, um, it's just a special thing for, for us. I don't know. So that was probably my most memorable deer hunt, you know, and, I, and I've killed quite a few of them, but that's, that's probably the, the best one. But, yeah. Especially when the deer comes in, there's, there's really no reason they don't have a history of doing it. Just all of a sudden, this yeah. night it decides to go a different way. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, and, and there was a trail in front of it. That's why we were sitting there. If they come out on the other side of this finger, they always worked up that side, but if they came out on, on the far side, they would never cross. And for, for whatever reason he did. Yeah. It's, it's strange, you know, it's God works in mysterious ways. Sometimes it right. seems like it's almost, you know, like it's meant to be. So no matter how bad you screw it up, it still works out. So yeah, sometimes that's the way it goes. Right. So, but no, that's probably my favorite one. Yeah. That, that, that would be a good one to, to remember. Yeah. And sure. Yeah, you know, all, all the ups and downs and, you know, you see it come out where it's not and it comes where it's not normally going to go and then sure. and then you get it and it runs off and you think it's not dead yet and you come back and you think it's still not dead yet and here it was dead all along <laughs> right yep exactly exactly so yeah I, I was i don't know i'll never forget how i felt that night i just laid in bed and just adrenaline all night long you know 12 hours of adrenaline dump and i was so wore out the next day it was awesome it was really 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 fun so yeah that would that would be uh uh, one of those nights would be hard to sleep because you got this this deer and 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 now it's like okay you, you got this this nice deer and you got all this great food that you're going to be able to eat and remember for a long right. time and a story that keeps will stay with you forever absolutely and that's yeah that's something like um even if it was a doe at that point i had never shot a deer and, and not found it within a couple minutes up up to that point in my life which like i said i'd shot quite a few with a gun um and I'm not great with a bow shooting, but I can shoot a gun pretty good. My first year with a with a gun, I shot it like 260 yards, and I shot him in the heart. <laughs> so um, I can shoot a gun pretty good, but so I never had any problem. That was the first year that it wasn't like immediate gratification. You know what I mean? So, oh and dad, yeah, dad raised me. You know, you wound an animal, you 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 know, if you wound one, can't find it. You better spend a week looking for it. You know, it's you owe it to right. a deer. Um, and that was the first one that I had that feeling. It's like, man, I do not like this at all. But yeah, so. That she was able to get it. That that's kind of the difference between rifle and and archery is. Oh, hundred percent. You know, you know that the time you get to spend, um, you know, with the with the you know on the hunt. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, with with the a rifle, you see the deer. You know, you see it out 160 yards. Yeah, with a rifle, it's no big deal. Shoot. Yeah, exactly. You know, with a bow, exactly. you're not even in range yet. No, no, no. You know, and at that point, I was he had restricted me to 15 yards, so it was gonna have to be right oh, there. You know? Yeah, so but I still don't shoot too far. Um, but I'll shoot one at 40 if I have to, and it's everything's perfect. Um, but right. I'm not comfortable about it. I mean, I um, with he had and stuff, I and mean, we we shoot 110, 120 yards in the yard all the time, but I always did that as if I can shoot. A 15 16 inch group at 100 yards then i could shoot a one inch group at 20 you know it's just right i felt like that distant shooting long distance like that made me so much better up close so oh yeah i i used you know you'd shoot at 20 yards when i was um had a uh, a club i was in you can go we can go back to 40 yards in indoors sure. and we'd shoot at 20 yards and then i go back to 30 and then go back to 40 and then i go back to 20 and i'm i'm destroying arrows where I wasn't right. the first time. It's like yeah. it's building that concentration to hold it tighter and tighter and tighter. And um, you know, shooting them longer ranges, as long as you don't start with the long range, you're missing your target completely. 
right. you know, start up at the 10 yards and, and as you get your groups tighter, then move back and you move tighter and tighter and eventually sure. you'll, you'll get those long ones. Um, Absolutely. But then as you get older, you don't see those targets that far out anymore. So now 100%. you start cutting them. Them long range ones might be a 40 right. yard shot, you know, instead of the hundred yard shot. For sure. And that that's something that, that I would say, and I'm, I'm nobody to give anybody any tips, but uh, compared shooting at home on the bag or shooting a live animal or whatever, it's totally different than shooting spots or shooting 3d to me. Um, oh yeah. Like at, at, at 20 yards, uh, shooting that little dime size X on a Vegas. I can't hardly see that. So at home, um, he had taught me this, but, uh, we had a, a big bag target, one of the three by five foot bag targets would hang with four by fours. Right. And it had right. black dots about the size of a golf ball all over it. So I would take golf tees and shove them in those dots. And that was about oh, yeah. the same size as a Vegas X, but you could see it. So, um, at 20 yards, I, you know, I shoot nine out of 10 of the tees. We'd go out and we'd have a little game about it and see who could shoot more. And, and I don't know if you know much about it yet. I know he talked on here, but, um, I listened to the podcast and he kind of underplays himself. If, if there was anybody on the planet, um, if, if somebody said, Hey, you know, I'm going to hold a gun to your head. You have to let somebody shoot an apple off your head at 60 yards. You can pick anybody, Levi Morgan, any of them. I would pick yeah. the idea hundred percent. But and he taught me, you know, everything I know about it. But he's a he's a shooter. But yeah, well, that was his trick. We we do golf tees, and uh, and just nail them. That was a lot of fun. It gave me something to aim at, you know. Um, right. That kind of aim small, miss small mentality. So the Vegas, I just cover up the yellow and hope that it went in the middle because <laughs> I can't see. It. But yeah, but. yeah, that that's kind of a, a problem sometimes. I know when I was getting ready to go to Canada. I borrowed a guy's out six. I had a four power scope on it. And I had a, a Springfield 1903, which is the regular a bead sight in front and a peep sight in the rear. And I wanted to set it up so that I could shoot. So we had we had a target out at 200 yards and put the target up 200 yards. And so I'm going to take some shots at it and see what's going on. Well, that front bead covered the whole two by two foot by two foot target. I could not see the target at all with the front bead. It right. covered it all. So I'm doing one of those up and down. Okay, that's it, left, right. Like, so I took three shots at 200 yards at a target I could not see and hit it three <laughs> times. That's awesome. Yep. I hit shooting, it three man. times. That's a two foot right. square. You know, right. I couldn't even see that. So I knew if I had to, I'd go to the backup gun and, you know, a moose has got, you know, oh, two, yeah. foot, two foot diameter kill zone. Right. So I could put that bead where I wanted it and, I end up using sure. it with the, the scope, but you know, a nice little four power scope and yeah. on a moose that didn't even fill up a third of the scope. It was, <laughs> it was a ways away. That's awesome. But I got it. You know, I, I used my steady stick, which is my arm. Right. You know, I saw on a rifle team in high school. So I, yeah. my steady stick is my hip and my arm. And, sure. and, you know, that's how I did it shooting standing and, and, one thing that you got to remember when you're sighting in at close range, you shoot at long range. If you're off slightly at your close range, you're going to be way off at long range. Oh, 100%. I, I, I didn't even think about that when I was doing it. And I was shooting just, you know, just slightly left at 100 yards. Not much, you know, just, you know, sure. maybe, you know, an eighth of an inch or so. Just And I was like, oh, okay, that that's close enough. Um, you know, not thinking about the fact that at 300 yards, I'm off by a couple feet. If right. not more. I'm probably right. about three feet. So I went to shoot this moose and I was on top of one hill and it was mostly up the next hill. You know, I wasn't at the top of the next hill because I won't shoot over the crest of a hill. He was down and she was down a little ways. So I shot and I just kind of looked around, moved a little bit, and I thought I had to have shot below it. It must be longer than that. I'm a bow hunter. I'm shooting 20 yards, not 300 sure. yards. You know, right. so uh, you know, so I I take the next one, I raise it up. Now I got it instead of at the kill zone, I got it at the at the spine. And this time it jumps and moves around. Because I'm far enough away, it's not really hearing the noise. Sure. And it just it's something hit the ground. So now okay, third shot. Now I'm up the head height. I shoot, it falls over dead. Didn't even take a step. Wow. It just fell over. I'm like, okay. So you know, in Canada, you you have to have your gun in a case. 
until it's shooting time. So I had to take the case, put the gun in the case and take it, you know, with this, because I wasn't leaving sure. it, you know, up there. So I get over there to it. I find one little drop of blood that's maybe, oh, eighth of an inch diameter on the snow. One sure. drop of blood. It didn't even take it. It just fell over. So we started gutting it. Still didn't find any blood hole or nothing. But the liver on a moose is huge. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, inch and a half or so thick and six, eight inches wide and probably a foot long and kind of sure. drooped it over my arm. And so we got it gutted and got it back. The next morning I'm cleaning it and I've got, I've got everything pretty much off. I no no bullet holes in the body or nothing. So finally, I, I'm from there, get ready to take that off. I find a bullet hole finally. The base of the skull is where it hit. Well, that would explain it. Yeah, that just <laughs> base of the skull, it just it didn't waste any meat at all because it just shattered some of the the, the neck and the spine and right sure. there at the neck. And that was that was a quick off button. It didn't even know it was hit, you know, at right. that point. Because it didn't, yeah. she didn't run or nothing, and 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 like okay, and that's when I realized, oh, I was shooting left at a hundred yards. At three hundred yards is 250, 300 yards, something like that at least. Because on top of one mountain, and it's halfway up the next mountain. Sure. And, you know, the four power scope, it not even maybe a quarter to a third of the scopes all it filled, so it didn't really fill the scope much. But you know, only four power scope. But, right. Yeah. Yeah. Th that was. That was interesting, you know, on, on that one. But, oh, that yeah, moose, talk about, talk about moose luck there. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah and and I, I, I don't know. Because I was just right over the kill zone, just moving straight up. Sure. You know, I didn't figure in any wind because there was no wind. So I didn't figure any wind. Right. It's just elevation. I just figure I'm dropping that much. Well, that's a problem. I didn't know the <laughs> rifle very well. Right. But now my, my new one, uh, I got a Browning X-Bolt. Sure. With a, it's, uh, it's a four by 16, 50 millimeter scope on it. Yeah. And it's sighted in dead on at 26 yards. So I'm dead on a 200, about three inches low at 300. Sure. And about an inch and a half low, high at 100. And I know it's dead on because when I was sighting it in, I took it to the local range here and I put three holes in the same shot, uh, three shots yeah. in the same hole. That's awesome. Well, that's why I reload. Because I you right. can do that with preloaded ammo. You can't do it with factory ammo because it's not <laughs> right. accurate enough. Yeah. So I, I know that's that's dead on. If I put the crosshairs where I want it to go, if I'm within 300 yards, I just put the crosshairs because I'm within three inches of my shot. Absolutely. But you know, I I know that now, but I didn't have right. a gun then. Right. I, just, I had I had to borrow one with a scope on it because I just had <laughs> iron sights. <You laughs> that's a 1903 Springfield. <laughs> right. Yeah, you you live and learn lessons all through life, right? That's cool. Well, the same thing, you know, in, in your bow. You know, if if you have if you have a little cant to your bow, and what a lot of people don't realize is if you take that bow and it's straight up and down, the pins are straight up and down, and everything is is plumb and level, and you turn sure. that bow slightly, as that top pin, as you move up, it moves over. So now you're shooting yep. more to the right if you're canning to the right or left if you're canning to the left. Which right hand is more going to go to the right, left hand is going to go to the left. But sure, you know that that's going to affect that too if you're not perfectly level. That's why if you put a level on your bow, you need to make sure it's level with your bow. Absolutely, if it's off, it's going to force everything off. And, and one thing to find, you know, to see if that's happening is go at your twenty yards, put your twenty yard pin on it, and shoot it shoot at the spot. Put your thirty yard pin on it, shoot at your 40, 50, 60. Just keep shooting sure. higher and higher wherever pins you have. And that line should you should be able to stick a string on it and it should touch all your arrows. Yeah. Kind of switch it after a little variation for your own shooting, but right. So so like I started to say earlier, dad raised me to be a killer, you know, not a not a shooter. But the the little bit of tuning that I ever did um was I would do what I think they called walk back tuning. We shoot at 20 and then hang a string from that arrow or or draw a line with a piece of tape or whatever, and then you'd try you I would adjust my rest until all my arrows were in that piece of tape or hitting that string um walk back to like 60 or 70 yards and um that was some of the best shooting bows that i ever had was the ones i did that to right but, but i've never got into this uh like shimming cams and yoke tuning and all that stuff i've never done any of it but if most bows don't need it right 
if there's something off on it a little bit, you might need to tweak a little bit. Um, I've tuned a lot of bows and, sure. you know, just the, the generic tuning, because uh, I'd set up so many of them. You know, I can take and set the center shot on on the bow really close just by using my eyes. Sure. Um, and I can I can I can set the fins left and right real easy. Uh, so now we're left and right, and it kind of guess I can get you really close just just by setting up no tools or nothing. Sure. Now if I'm going to go on a little bit, you know, I do that with beginner bows when I when I had my store. I do that all beginner because that's how the bows are set up. And for a beginner bow, we didn't really go through much more because the skill of the archer hadn't met. The skill of the bow right now at some point the skill of the archer is going to need a better tuned bow uh your little more oh, high-end ones i would i would get into using uh levels and lasers for setting everything up so it was you know sure. dead dead nuts on and and uh, you know because it, it took a little bit more to set them up and and on the beginner bows you know once you got a little bit better on it um you know and lots of times they're not even buying very straight arrows right so until you start buying your competition grade arrows, your 1,000 straightness, or, or when we're doing aluminums, your one and a half thousand straightness ones, it didn't matter because you sure. you can take, uh, you can take a group that might group one inch with one thousandths, and you take five thousandths, and now that one inch group is now about three inches with a five thousand straightness arrow. Sure. The only difference is the arrow. Right. Um, so until you start getting in that high, higher end stuff, I don't recommend going through you know, spending high dollar to have somebody, you know, super tune your bow and go through all that mass, you know, just sure. set it up so that your arrow is, is level with your string and, you know, comes as right angle to the string and the arrow goes through, you know, the upper third of the burger button. And it's, if it's a center shot design riser, that it's center shot, that's good enough for 99% sure. of the people. Right. Because, you know, you, like, like you, you know, you're, you're not looking to shoot them 60 X's. You right. just need to be good enough that you, you can be confident that you're going to put that arrow within that, you know, that three inch kill zone or six inch kill 100%. zone, depending on where you're at. Now, turkeys, you got about a one inch kill zone. Yeah. Go uh, but, yeah. I'm not, I don't, I'm turkey on with a bow a little bit and it's not for me. I, I'll shoot them with a shotgun. I'm okay with it. <laughs> I, I, I enjoy it. Um, and I've headshot a few turkeys and, and I can do it. No problem. But it's just, I've been on too many wild goose chases with turkeys and with buddies and, and stuff where they shoot them in the body and we just never find the dang things. And the, no. the, the thing is, they're probably dead, but a turkey can hide in six inches of grass like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's oh, yeah. Um, we Ead was one actually way back in the day. I was probably 10 or 12 years old. He shot one and we went and tracked it and there was actually some blood, which is pretty rare for you know a bow shot turkey. We actually right. blood trail. Then we lost it. So we grid searched this property. It's probably a 75 acre field and a little bit of timber. We're grid searching. And I walked literally less than two yards away from this turkey. And all of a sudden I hear something. I turn around and look and it's standing there looking at me. And one of its legs is busted. And then it tries to take off flying. We end up chasing it down and got the bird. But it was literally six feet away or less. And I walked right past it in a, in a grass field. So... Yeah, I don't know. I, I'll shoot him in the head with a shotgun. I'll be okay yeah. with it. So. Yeah, you don't need the head anyway. And yeah, tur turkeys are so so unbelievably tough. It's it's unreal. Um, we shot one a few years ago. Uh, I sh shot one with a shotgun, and we we're you know dressing it, and it had there was not a, a stitch of coagulated blood, no scabs, no nothing. We pulled its skin off, and there was a perfect X through one breast, and a perfect X coming out the other one. And not, it, somebody shot it with a fixed blade broadhead, went all the way through, and that turkey was fine. I mean, he acted like there wasn't nothing wrong with him. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. And and most most of the time, I find that people don't know where to shoot a turkey with a bow. Uh, you know, like you said, they have a golf ball size spot to aim at, and they don't know where it is. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, we have, we've always gone by you know where bronze meets black up the leg. So where the bronze and the black meet on the wing, and if you go straight up the leg, you're, you're right in there usually. Um, but like I said, I'm not confident in that enough even to, to worry about doing it. So, Well, when you look, when you go to a store and buy a turkey, they give you the bag with the heart and everything in it. Right. Look how big They're that tight. heart is. Oh, yeah. It, it, it might be a one inch at, yeah. at most uh, yeah. distance across the top to the bottom. Exactly. You know, by three quarters. So it, 
and they're so tough that if you don't hit that a deer you know i mean you don't have to heart shoot a deer for it to die you, i mean deer yeah. are tough too you can you can single lung a deer and it live forever but but at the same time you got a little more margin for error but you mess a turkey's heart or lungs and you're you're just screwed though <laughs> they're gonna fly away right so, um and it, a deer at least can't fly you know you kind of track right. down tur turkeys to fly away so but yeah then, then there's no trail and then they'll slide under brush and yeah and, or know, they'll they're, they're I've seen, track i've seen one where it, it flew up and landed in a tree and ended up dying up there and like how the heck did we get it down now you know right but oh, hit a button on my keyboard turn my camera yeah. off <laughs> i think i hit the space bar for some reason turn my camera right. off. that's my good right but so, yeah, I, I think I, I heard you live in Nebraska, right? Right. Yeah, we, we came over in Turkey on Nebraska a little bit uh, when I was in high school. It was, it was a lot of fun over there. You got a lot of birds. Or the, yeah. where we went, it was anyway. Oh, so, where'd you go? You know, I wish I could remember the little town. Uh, we went to an outfitter. He had took me. Um, but I can't remember what the heck the, the name of the outfitter was. I think it was about two or three hours in inside the border in the middle of the state, if I remember right, looking at the map. Oh, okay. But I, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even know if you said it. But we went to an outfitter there, and, and it was a blast. I and mean, we'd drive around. We were only there for two days. We killed our four birds and went back home. Um, but you'd drive, and you'd see a, a flock of turkeys, you know, 150, 200 turkeys standing in somebody's front yard. It's just it's unreal. I've never seen anything like it in my life. That's actually, that's a really memorable hunt uh, with the turkeys. We went out set a blind in the, the middle of, um, I don't know what you guys call them, grasslands or whatever, but there wasn't even hardly any grass. It's just a lot of hills and real short stubble grass. Does that sound Yeah, familiar? they've been out in the sand hills. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so we're sitting right out in the middle of the wide open. You know, turkeys don't care about blinds. Um, and there's one oak tree, the just biggest oak tree you've ever seen. And there's like, there's got to be over a hundred turkeys roosted in this tree. And it's like, there's no other trees for miles around. You can look at every direction. That's the, they don't have any option. That's where they got to go. So we set up, you know, 150 yards from that. And all of a sudden you got 30 or 40 birds strutting into you and hens everywhere. And like, vocalizations like I've never heard before in my life. They're all talking. And, man, that was awesome. That was unreal. Yeah. So, you know, their only choice is to fly down and, and walk the other way, but they didn't, they didn't do that. So. No, it was, it was a blast. I'd like to come back there and do it again. Yeah, I've got a group of about three dozen that hangs out, you know, not too far from me. Sure. I'm not sure where all they go, um, but I've got, I got some spots. So over here, um, it's a lot of timber ground, and there's a lot of agriculture too, but so uh, when we had our farm or whatever, there was – there was like a little over four or 500 continuous acres that we could hunt. Right. And there were on a good year, we'd have four mature gobblers and maybe 20 hens on the whole farm. Um, and usually they'd end up spreading out onto the neighbors and stuff by the end of the year. I mean, it, we're not covered up with them out here like that. So going out there and seeing stuff like that, it was just, it was, I couldn't believe it. It was unreal. So. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of interesting. We do have quite a few turkeys around here. Yeah. Yeah. Not as many pheasants as we used to, but more turkeys now. Yeah, yeah no kidding. Our pheasants are making a comeback. I don't know, I don't know why, because they said the bobcats took out a lot of them, but we have more bobcats now than we've ever had, and, and the pheasants are making a comeback. So I'm not really sure what what happened, but uh, we're seeing quite a few of them. No, that's good. Yeah, you know, every once in a while I'll see a pheasant, but you know, not like I used to when I was a kid. Yeah. Of course, I know hardly ever seen a turkey when I was a kid, but <laughs> yeah. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's uh, the has, same habitat. Has there always been deer over there, or did they kind of make a comeback for you too? Well, there's always been deer, just not high numbers. Sure. Uh, but they've made a big come out and come back. Uh, there for a while, a few years, you had unlimited uh, antlers tags. There was two two deer per tag, unlimited number they issued. Sure. Uh, and now there's they still issue your antlers tag, which is you know, for your antlers deer, um, but there's only so so many of them are going to issue, and they do limit those a little bit. It, there's sure. still quite a few. It's it's unbelievable the times you know the the stuff that you see in a lifetime or whatever. But um, like 
my grandpa, my dad's dad, he shot a, a 10 point buck and we still have him mounted now. We got a new cape for him and redid it. Um, cause it got ruined by cigar smoke actually, but, uh, yeah. it is a 10 pointer, probably three and a half year old deer, maybe 110 inches, 115 inches. If that real spindly, uh, but he's a cool looking deer, just perfect 10 and his G2s, G3s and G4s are all under two inches long. Oh yeah. And he shot it in the early seventies. And dad said that he made the front page of the paper and they put that deer in the bed of the truck and drove around for like three days with it because people oh, just nice. could, they'd never seen a deer like that. Like the, the, they just didn't have them, I guess. It was a huge, huge deal. Oh yeah. And this, this is down in, in central Missouri where he grew up. But, and now people won't even shoot a deer like that. You know I mean? They're embarrassed to yeah. if they shoot it. They won't, they won't even post a picture of it or anything. So it's crazy. The times change, you know? I know when I started deer hunting, they, they had bumped it up to, you could get two tags a year. Um, prior to that, it was, you know, all, you don't had one tag. You only get one deer a year is all you could get. And, sure. and then when I started um, deer hunting, you can get two tags. And then they've upped it from there. So, sure. you know, I, I know when I had, had my store as a check station, and I know guys that checked in 20, 20 plus deer, oh, yeah. really shot 20 plus deer. Yeah, because they just they'd fill their antlers tags, and then they'll get some more, fill some more. They right. had an area that had so many of them in them that they were able to just, you know, just get as many as they they wanted, and how um, how much can you eat, you know? Sure, that's that's how we were uh, with the farm. Is I mean, I don't know. People don't like to kill a bunch of deer, but we were so covered up in them. Like that, we don't hunt this. I don't hunt this alfalfa field. It's like a 60 or 70 acre alfalfa field. And every night in early season, there'd be over 80 deer in it just out there eating. You know, we had a pile of them. Um, and they were, they were like that all over the whole farm. But um, so, I mean, one year we killed 16 does off that farm between me, dad, Ead, and a couple other buddies that we brought out. I mean, just you have to manage the population a little bit. But right. I don't know. I've been blessed. Like I said, it used to be where you didn't hardly see a deer. My entire lifetime, we've been it's like they're possums out there, you know, we just got a, a billion of them running around. So I've been really blessed with that. Yeah. I, I know. I've, I've talked to guys at the, the farm they're hunting. The farmer says, shoot as many as you want and take, take the one you want. Shoot them yeah. off. Cause yeah. they, they'd, they'd swim the river. Cause they, they wouldn't allow them to hunt over there. So they'd swim the river at night and then come in and eat all his crops and then go back yeah. there during the day because they couldn't hunt. So when they come over, uh, I, I've talked to other, you know, I've heard other stories that they'd go out at night with scopes and just shoot them, pile them up, and burn them. Sure. You know, because it's unbelievable, they, isn't it? They they destroy so much crops, and right. you know, you've got your deprivation permits that you know they'll they'll issue here for farmers sure. that have a lot of deer problem, and um, I don't know if they they do it or not, but uh, I think they was they won't issue one unless you're out hunting on your property. Sure. So if you're not going to allow hunters on your property, we're not going to issue a deprivation permit because that's the first thing. Right. You know, allow that's hunting right. on your property and, and yeah. it'll take care of it. And, you know, when a deer eats, you know, what, about two tons of food a year. Right. You know, that's that's a lot of a lot of grain that the farmer can't sell. Oh, 100 percent. They, they'll desolate field. I mean, it's unreal. Um, yeah, you got to you got to keep a handle on them for sure. You don't want to overdo it like they did, but. Um, but every couple of years here, they have programs in the, in the bigger towns and stuff where they'll bring in guys, DNR agents and stuff, they'll pile up corn and, and hunt them at night and just, they'll fill truckloads of them, you know, because they're in town and stuff. People are hitting them with cars all the time and, and all yeah. that. And so yeah, you gotta do something, I guess. Well, and the meat don't go to waste. Normally do that. Then they take the meat, right. and process it and, you know, for, you know, Hush program and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not like they're piling it up and and no, uh, not at all. Let it go to not, waste. Not at all. Not at all. No, that all gets it all gets used, and, and I'm not against it whatsoever. I mean, like I said, they're feeding the hungry, and and we got to keep a handle on the population. So, yeah, we have a really awesome program in Iowa. It's help us stop hunger. The Hush program is what they call it, but I'm sure every state has something like that. But yeah, they donate yeah. them all. Uh, no, it's really cool. It's good. Yeah, so. Fred, you're over on the southeastern part of Iowa. Yeah, right where Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa all come together. So I can get to Missouri in like 10 minutes and Illinois in 
probably 15. <clears throat> live right on the river here yeah yeah it's kind of looked up with it, the city you lived in it's like oh okay cool way over there <laughs> yeah oh yeah yep yeah i can actually uh i don't know if you ever heard of it or not probably not but the mormon temple you ever heard of that the mormon yeah. trek uh i can see the mormon temple from my house it's a, it's a pretty oh, yeah. like it's a big deal for them yeah it's people travel from all over the world and come and they do their they call it a pilgrimage i believe but right. every fall, I think it's fall, but they'll just be crawling. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of people here. And it's funny because I live in a town of like 250 or 300, something like that, little bitty town. And all of a sudden we have more people here than we know what to do with. So, yeah. But, but well, I'm a little village, about 168 people. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we had all of a sudden had a few hundred people show up, you know, that'd be kind of. Oh, it's a big deal. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The, the the local businesses and stuff love it that's for sure so it's good for the economy but. well we have we have a post office we have two trucking companies we have a church and um uh, one guy that is a construction company to live here i don't know sure. that's it that's the only businesses there yeah, used to be got... a, a restaurant many many years ago but it's been gone for decades <laughs> We got a, a bar and grill, a Casey's, a church, and a post office. That's it. That's all we got. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of town. But, yeah, we're we're our village is a little bit smaller than that. So yeah, yeah. But we have a couple of bigger towns not too far far away. That's uh, that's Omaha, how I Lincoln, am. Come <laughs> on, Lincoln's probably 35, 40 miles away. So oh, really? We can go to a big town really easy. Sure. Yeah, we're, uh, I've got two towns of about 6,000 people, 10 minutes to the north, 10 minutes to the south. And then like Iowa City is an hour and a half away. That's the next biggest town. It's only got 100 or 200,000 people in it. Um, but yeah, there's nothing really big in Iowa. And I like it that way. I'm not a big city yeah. type of guy. Yeah, so, I, I don't think I'd like to live in one of the great big cities. I, I don't even I drive, like to through, drive through them. <laughs> right. I drive through them all the time. Is I fish uh, tournaments all over the country, so I'm always, always driving through them, and I'm like, man, I could never live in a place like this. This is uh, insane. So, no, just driving through Omaha is bad enough sometimes. So you oh yeah, get that rush hour traffic. It's I yeah. try to plan everything so I don't hit rush hour traffic. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you got try driving through Nashville with a thirty foot trailer on. It ain't no fun. Oh, <laughs> I, I yeah. can only imagine. Yeah, it ain't no it, fun. Driving in a car through Nashville is no fun. So, <laughs> right, they do imagine. not care. Yeah, they will. They imagine. will not get out of your way. <laughs> so let's. Uh, you got the Twisted Cat outdoors on his tell uh, hat on. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, I kind of converted about four years ago over from hunting to fishing. <laughs> I still hunt a little bit. Um, but that the farm that I'm referring to, it all got sold. We had a, we owned some and, and leased some, and it all got sold. And I was spoiled my whole life with this this incredible deer hunt, you know. And I'd knock on a few doors, and you know, always got no's and stuff. And, and I'm like, man, this kind of stinks. And then I realized that nobody could tell me I couldn't go on the river, so I went right. and bought a boat. So I bought a boat, and I've been been catfishing ever since. So Twisted Cat Outdoors is a, a national level tournament trail um that i compete in i used to help run it um it's ran by a, a guy that lives here pretty close by uh, but i don't get enough time off work to uh to help run it anymore so i just decided to compete in all the events that i could and, and miss the ones that i couldn't so but yeah we go go all over the all over the midwest and, and fish some really really cool places for some some giant catfish so it's a lot of fun yeah it but. sounds like a I normally fish lakes for channel cats when I sure. go fishing. You know, that's kind of sure. the fish I normally fish for. But, you know, growing up, that's most we fish for that. You know, it's Oh, cool. absolutely. Absolutely. So I live, as you know, Montrose. It's right above the, the Keokuk Dam on the Mississippi River. And we actually call it, uh, what do they call it? Lake. There's a, there, the locals have a name for it. They call it a lake. There's no current whatsoever. It's all channel cats. 
So we'll go on channel catfish in the spring. And then the blue cats migrate every year. They'll migrate south down to the St. Louis area. And then every spring they migrate up to spawn. So I've got some of the best blue cat fishing right below the dam, which is 15 minutes away. And some of the best channel cat fishing in the state right out of my front door. So um, kind of kind of blessed there, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, we'll go out and catch 30, 40 channel cats and, you know, you'll catch four or five will be over 10 pounds, you know, pretty much every time. And, and a 10 pound channel cats, pretty, pretty good size um, for around right. here. So up north, they get them where they're 20, 25 pounds, but yeah, we don't, we don't get them like that here. So, but yeah, it's, it's a blast. So. I know my cousin, he was fishing in some of the sand pits and, and they get huge in there and he'd pull some of these 20, 25 pounders out. And he yeah. says, no, no problem getting them up to about 10 foot of water. And right. once 10 foot of water, the fight started because they was not coming in anything shallower than 10 foot. Because they used to be down in, you know, 30, 40 foot of water. And sure. they come up that 10 foot of water. And man, he he had some some heads on them that was just just huge, wider than oh yeah, you know, probably twice, almost one and a half times the width of your own head. And sure, there were there were some big old heads on the, some of them. Oh, yeah. fish he's pulling that's up. That's awesome. That's really awesome. The the my favorite way to target them uh, up here is it's really shallow mud flats, pretty much everywhere. So it'll be a foot or two feet of water. I'll push pull my boat in because you know my motor won't run in it or whatever. So I'll push pull right. in. And then uh, put down spud poles is what we call them. And I'll cast out in a foot of water and you'll see them hit it. They'll swirl on top of the water on your bait before your rod moves. That's, oh man, it's a blast. And when you're fighting them, they don't have anywhere to go. They can't go down. So they either have to go straight away from you or straight to you. And a lot of times it's it's a race. They swim fast and like they'll get to your boat before you get the slack out of it. And then... Uh, <laughs> they haven't fought so they're, they're full of energy three feet away from you it's a, it's oh, a lot of fun yeah. so yeah but yeah what, no, what do you use for bait for the channels uh shad most of shad yeah yeah or golden shiners if i can get some great big golden shiners i'll use those too um but yeah just I, all use, for... I use chicken liver yeah no it works good um that's a beautiful thing about about channel cat fishing is I mean, you can use, you know, chicken liver, stink baits, you know, fresh cut bait. You can use live bait, uh, these prepared, you know, little dough balls at the store and stuff. I mean, chicken breast, you can use whatever you want. They're going to eat it. So, right. Uh, so, I had one guy come to my store is using, I think, the black and yellow crappie jigs. Sure. And catching catfish on it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Catfish and, and, your viewers probably don't care about this, but catfishing is changing a lot. Uh, people used to treat them as if they're, you know, a lazy bottom feeder. They're nasty mud fish, you know, they just eat dead stuff. And that's not true. We have uh, live sonar now, you know, with active target or live scope. I'm sure you've heard of it. And you can actually see what they're doing down there. And they're, they are the apex predator uh, in any body water they're in. They're like sharks. So you catch them on the bottom, but they're swimming in, in the water column too and chasing live bait and, and all kinds of stuff. So we're starting to catch them in different ways. I catch them on uh, uh, hair jigs sometimes. So I got these great big hair jigs. They're about four or five inches long with great big hooks, and they'll chase them down and hit them. It's it's unreal. It's a lot of fun. Huh. Yeah, so, you always learn something new, you know, about them. Right. Absolutely. Yep. So it, it is kind of, kind of fun. You, you know, I tell people I catfish or whatever and they're like, Oh yeah, it's lazy. You're sitting there and, and you know, drinking beer or whatever, whatever you're doing, which I don't do that, but, uh, the, it, it's not like that. It's, it's nonstop action all the time. It's about to, uh, it's about to take off to the catfishing is the number two fastest growing, um, outdoor sport right now. So bass fishing is oh, yeah. number one. It has been for years and years. Catfishing is closing the distance in behind it. So, and I fish Twisted Cat, which is the top elite level tournament series uh, in the country. There's two or three regions, and we're one of them. So, I don't know if you follow professional bass fishing at all, um, but we're kind of uh, on the level. Not too much, but yeah, we're kind of on the the level of you know MLF or or um, 
Bassmaster type of level stuff right now, and, and it's only getting bigger. So, but I kind of got in at the right time where you don't have to be super good to be to qualify. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I grew up, you know, hunting and fishing all the time. And sure. You know, that I've, yeah. I've done a little bit of bow fishing as well. And oh, yeah. Is that something you've done, but some bow fishing? Uh, a little bit um I've, I've never gotten too into it but i've done a little bit of it and it's fun the the majority of the of what i've done is uh we flood a lot here so these big bean fields will flood down the river bottom and we used to in high school we'd back our trucks up into the water and then you'd stand in the tr bed of your truck and wait for them to swim by because there'd just be thousands of carp work up in there and that was a lot of fun i've never really done it out of a boat but it, it looks like a blast so yeah it's it's a lot of fun yeah and you can do it from the bank and, and sure. everything else too and sure. uh, i know i know one time i was out shooting these these big carp were coming by and i was like i missed shoot again miss this gar come by you know a gar is only like you know inch diameter oh tight, yeah I, I got it I'm like <laughs> well what's what's the deal i'm missing all these big carp and i i hit this little bitty gar right right that oh, was awesome. inter that was interesting it was only you know i couple feet long so it wasn't you know a huge one sure uh, trying to clean it to eat it was was interesting oh yeah that's a nightmare a, a you break up knife, a hat yeah a hunting knife a hatchet and a fillet knife yeah you know the, yep. the fillet knife to um i mean the hunting knife to split the belly open the hatchet sure. to cut it in pieces small enough you could work with and the fillet knife to flay off the the meat off of the outside hard shell <laughs> sure Sure. And then, you know, cut them out and it, it kind of looked like the meat on a rock bass. Yeah. Kind of real, real, real clear with little black lines through it, like a rock bass. Yep. They eat like a pork chop too. They're like, it's, it's a strange texture. You know, it's yeah. not like fish to me anyway. But 10 snips come in real handy for those. You cut them with 10 snips down the back and you can peel both sides out and open them up. Oh, yeah. And peel out of them. But uh, yeah, they're a, they're a nightmare to clean. I don't do it unless I have to. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, I I shot it. And I was like, I wanted to, I wanted to oh, clean yeah. it and eat it. You 100%. know, yeah, you gotta, I've, gotta eat it. Yeah, gotta gotta try it anyway. Right, and they're they're pretty good eating. I mean, I I like them. It's just yeah. it's not worth the work for me, you know. Unless, like I said, unless I'm really really hankering for one. But, yeah, but you know, that's when it's the only one you actually ended up hitting that day. <laughs> sure, sure. You know, you're, yeah. you're you're gonna eat what you do finally kill. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's unreal how tough they are. It's crazy. But. And then, and then carp. You know, there's restaurants around here that serve catfish and carp. Sure. You know, that's what they're serving is catfish and carp. And, sure. And you know, when you have a restaurant that serves those kind of feet, uh, fish as their only fish items on the menu. In fact, they're only real. They, they might have you know like ambers or something, but sure. you know, if that's the only fish on their menu, you know, why would we not go out and fish for it and get it for real cheap instead of paying high dollar for a catfish fillet you know for sure for sure yeah yeah we we have a little uh fishery in town here of course it's a river town so there's commercial fishing or whatever but uh man he sells a lot of it there's a there's a pretty big catholic population around too so during lent or whatever man he sells catfish like you would believe oh so, yeah i bet he does <laughs> yeah yeah people people don't want to go catch it uh or some people don't so and it's like it is funny i laugh like if you only knew how easy it'd be to just go catch those fish and clean them yourself you know but they're not big they're just little channel cats but but they'll go pay for it and it's good for him it's good business so right you know he goes out and gets them and right if it wants a fish then he's got a market oh yeah 100 percent. so so what what would you tell uh, a new archer that's thinking about getting into archery, what advice would you give them? Um, don't overthink it. Just go shoot your bow. It's not, you don't have to be, you know, Levi Morgan, your first, first trip out. You want to, you know, have good fundamentals and stuff, but just go shoot your bow. Um, that's what, like I said, I was never an elite, you know, level target shooter or anything like that, but I could shoot with, if we just got the guys together and went out in the backyard and shoot, I would, I could pretty much beat all them. And it was just simply because I would every single day, uh, from, you know, the time I was probably 14 until I was 19 or 20, 
I made it a point. I'd shoot two to 300 arrows a day and just go out and just reps, you know. And in the wintertime, I'd set up a little block or a bag 12 yards away in the garage, and I'd just shoot it until the guts fell out of it, you know. Um, it's just – just shoot. Just go shoot your bow. So that's yeah. my – that's my two cents. Yeah. Well, and that's what you got to do is just, just shoot. You're not going to get any better if you don't shoot. Uh, and, and if you're struggling, you know, find somebody that knows a little bit more than you do. Find an instructor and, 100%. and ask yeah, you them. Know. And that's a, that's definitely a precursor. And like I said, I had some mentors and stuff. Um, yeah. Find somebody that knows what they're doing. You don't want to go out there and shoot like that. Shoot a couple hundred arrows a day with bad form or bad tendencies. So I guess that's that's a precursor. You want to make sure that you know you're doing the right things to a certain extent. You don't have to be perfect, but have good form and 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 shoot as much as you can. Build, you know, build your anchor point. You know, build to where it's just muscle memory to where you know you have to go on public land or whatever, and a 190 inch deer walks by. It's mechanical. You don't have to think about it. You put your pen where you think it ought to go, and you and you shoot, and it's not. You know, it's just second nature to you, you know, so that's what I'm all about. Is I want to, I want a quick, clean kill on an animal and, and, uh, I don't want to have to think about it. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of resources out there to get help. You know, you can, you can join the Archer Talk 101 Facebook group. Uh, sure. There we have archers and techs and instructors in all kinds of levels. Go ahead and join that group. I'll leave a link in the description on, you know, where that group is. Get in there. And if you have a question, ask it. You know, Absolutely. we're more than willing to help you. You know, or get a hold of me, you know, or, or get a hold of you or somebody. You know, sure. and, and the group just post, you know, hey, I'm having a problem. What am I doing wrong? You know, I, just record a video and sure. upload it to the group. I sure. don't upload a YouTube video because they 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 don't get they don't stay long. Right. <laughs> but just right. upload your raw video and uh um we'll we'll just take and we'll take a look at it and we'll give you some pointers and we've Absolutely. done that on many times and uh you know it's a safe place to go uh you're not going to have people harassing you because you're asking a, uh what should be a beginner's question simple question uh because you know we're all there to help you sure um, and you're not going to be sold anything because anybody that posts anything be sold uh the post is deleted and they're removed from the group so sure. it, it's a it's a safe place you're not going to be sold anything um you know, if there's anything that you're looking for, you know, hey, sometimes we'll give advice. You know, I'll I'll interview, you know, different different guys and different companies and you know, so that uh, you know, if you want to have some information, you know, you'll get them on the, the podcast. I do post the uh the podcast in the group so you can watch the video there so you can watch us. And if you have any questions about anything we talk about on the podcast, go ahead and ask them. You know, we'd be glad to help you. Uh and then you can always listen to the podcast on Spotify, or you can go out to Audible and just look for Archer Talk 101 uh, podcast, and and you'll be able to get watch it there. And you know, there's a lot of places you can go out there and connect with us. Uh, you'll be able to see this on my YouTube channel. Learn to fix it yourself. Um, that's the channel I have, and I have all kinds of stuff, not just archery stuff, but right. well, that's like the channel says, learn to fix it yourself. You know, I've right. been around for so long fixing stuff. I'm just recording what I'm fixing and and doing and. <laughs> And, you know, hey, if it helps, it helps, you know. Uh, sure. So that's that's how you can get a hold of us. And we'll leave links in here. And, you know, if you're if you're interested in uh, getting on that catfishing tournament, I'll, I'll leave a link to the uh, uh, Twisted Cat Outdoor uh, in the description. So if you, you know, if you're cat, you know, cat fisherman, uh, then, sure. hey, that'll make it easier to find it. You don't have to try and search for it. So absolutely. And, and another little shameless plug or whatever. I'm in the process of getting my captain's license right now. So I'll be a U.S. Coast Guard certified captain and I'm going to start guiding here in Southeast Iowa. So, um, yeah, get a hold of me on there. It's Easy Life Outdoors, my Facebook page, if you want to get on Facebook or whatever. Okay. Um, somebody wants to go out catfishing and, and see what that's all about, then you can get a hold of me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Just send me a link to, link to those and I'll put them in the description and, and that Absolutely. would make it easier if we get to them, you know. Let, For hey, sure. Let's make it easy. Right. No doubt. <laughs> if it's, if it's easy to do, then, then more people we'll do will it. likely do it. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Well, any parting thoughts? Nothing, nothing I can think about. Like I said, just, just get out there and shoot. And, um, 
I don't know. I, I beat a dead horse there, but uh, like I said, I think, you know, the more you shoot and that long distance thing, I think that really, really helps, um, help with consistency. So just shoot as much as you can and, and as far, far away as you can, if, if yeah. it helps me, uh, within, you know, safe reason. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's what helped me the most in, in archery was, you know, I'd shoot more arrows at 70 plus than I would at 20, you know? So it just makes, makes you so much more consistent. You have to, you have to be hard and fast on your form and, and everything to me. So, but that's all I got for you, Roy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And don't be concerned about the fast bows. Cause what I say about fast bow, the faster the bow, the more it magnifies your mistake, the better yeah, you have to be. Yeah. So, the quicker, the quicker you miss sometimes. Right. So. Right. So <laughs> don't worry about you know, getting that fastest bow because that fastest bow is way harder to shoot and harder to tune broadheads on 100 percent. the best best shooting bow i've ever owned in my life um, and i wish i could buy it back was the uh, matthew z7 extreme and that thing was slow i shot a 600 grain arrow out of it and i i don't even know how about 240 feet a second maybe i mean you could almost outrun the arrow you know what i mean but man it shot good and it killed a lot of animals and stuff and, um you don't always need the the best most premium bow i got in that that thing for a while I bought, I've owned probably, God, I don't know, I have 20, 22 bows. I always buy the the newest, best thing. And sometimes I'd have three bows at a time and just shoot and shoot and shoot. And then I'd buy a new one. And I, I never had a bow that shot as good as that, that old Z7 extreme. So sometimes you find something that works. It's not always best to go buy the, the right. newest, best thing. So. Well, my hot bow is a 2001 PSC and my, yeah. Target bow is a 2003 PSE. Yeah. And then when I was working at uh, uh, Cabela's, they had some bunch of returns and I was able to buy a, a bear. I forget which model it was. It was like $900 just for the, the plain bow. Sure. And I got it for, you know, really cheap. And that's a 2015. I hadn't even set it up yet. I, I had to right. repair it, you know, to get it ready to shoot, but sure. I never even shot it yet. So, you know, that's my newest bow and I haven't even shot it. Right. Yeah. I don't even know if it's any good or not. Right. Yeah. The, I just got the a good vice on it. <laughs> right. The last one I bought was uh, uh, Matthew's Tri-X, and I've had that since it came out. I don't know, 2016 or 17, something like that. And that was at that point, I could shoot the tracks almost as good as I could shoot the Z7 Extreme. And I was like, all right, I'm done. That's, I'm, I'm holding this bow and we're sticking with it. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I bought a bunch of them there for a while. So, and every brand, and I'd always come back. So, yeah. Well, that's the key is to get something that feels good in your hand to start with. That, yeah. uh, that first year was with a PSE Nova, and that was an older, older bow, and that bow yep. shot really, really well, too. Um, I like my PSEs, too. And I, once they started going for the crazy speeds, that's when I kind of got out of the, got out of PSE. But they, they were chasing that 360 feet a second for a while and, and all that. So, um, but yeah, the older ones, I love the older PSEs. Yeah, I was, I was a PSE dealer in, in my 2001 as a PSE Carrera. Yeah. And then the, the other one's 2003 Scorpion PSE. Sure. And sure. Uh, my my sons have the, um, was it the Accelerator PSE? So sure. you know, all, all my kids have PSEs and I have PSEs right. and I have that one bear. <laughs> right. Yeah. Now, Pete, even my you recurve is a P Yeah. Right. Even my recurve is a PSE. <laughs> That's awesome. That's Except awesome. my very first recurve, which was a 25 pound fiberglass recurve, was a Ben Pearson. But that was in the 60s. Sure. I don't I don't think Pete Shepley had bows at that point. Right. Yeah, no kidding. I wish I knew what it was. I think it's that same brand that my dad had when he was a little kid. Dad was born in 69. And his first bow, we still have it. And it's a little recurve. It's a real bright yellow color. It's made out of wood, but it's real light color. I think it's a Ben Pearson. But I'll always have that it's a cool, cool bow. So yeah, I still have mine. It's I won't shoot it. I won't even. Uh, yeah, string we don't it. Either. Yep. Uh, it's got the string on it, but you can see the fiberglass. You know, last time we strung it, see it's starting to it's starting sure. to separate a little bit. So uh, sure. it's just it just sits there as a um, decoration, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's how it is, is. We won't shoot it either, but it's pretty cool. Glad we still so, have it. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those things. You just, you just kind of keep it. It has no monetary value. Right. It has a lot of sentimental value. 
100 yeah. percent you know my old ben pearson you know if i was to sell it if i was lucky to get two three bucks on it i'd be doing good it's <laughs> right worth more, it's worth way more than that to me you oh, know, 100%. My first bow and you know it's in the 60s and and you know i i won't ever sell it i i, I i'll do with it but right i my dad sold his bow he uh, he used to keep track and he had this bow and he shot over 200 deer with it over the years. He kept it for a long, long time. He shot over 200 deer with this bow and he, he, uh, my mom divorced him and he fell on hard times. He had to sell it. And about six, seven years ago, I tracked it down and bought it back. Oh, cool. And, uh, yeah, that's, that bow will never leave, never leave my family again. I don't think, but yeah, we've got it framed and it's up on the wall and he, he lost it. That's, there's something to that sentimental stuff. It's really, really cool. Right. Um, but yeah, no, that's, I don't know. I'm pretty young to be all sentimental and stuff, but I don't sell anything. Cause I know at some point my kids, it might mean something. It might mean nothing to me now, but at some point my kids might want it, you know, so I'm right. pretty careful about that stuff. But anyway. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. hundred percent. So. Well, Seth, it's been great talking with you. Had yeah. a lot of fun. Um, Got some good stories and sure and just good conversation and i, I know uh well let uh tell Iad uh hi for me well then um, yeah he'll, and and if he wants to come back on sometime hey just get a hold of me we love oh, to yeah. talk again and maybe we have a whole group of you on one time sure that'd, that'd be, be a lot of fun yeah, yeah that'd be a lot, lot of fun. fun yeah we can have we can have a lot of people on here too so that'd be fun sure. talking with the group of you so uh we'll 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 be seeing you another time I'm sure you'll you'll we'll be in contact and uh it's been great talking with you. My name is Roy Canterbury. I've been host today on Arch Talk 101, and we'll see you on the next one.